Good afternoon and welcome to our third lecture this week on aspects of quantum information science and, and uh, engineering. Uh, my name is Reinhold Mann and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research at the uh, University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here, also those who call in remotely. Um, we uh, started uh, this uh, lecture series to recognize World Quantum Day, which was held on the 4th of April, 14th of April. And uh, we are part of a community effort that attempts to generate a thousand experiences, learning experiences about quantum in the period from Quantum Day to the end of May. And uh, if you go to the website that EPB set up, uh, if you just punch in uh, Gig City Goes Quantum, you'll see what the status is uh, of the path to those thousand events, among others. And you also see all the events, and you can also watch the lectures asynchronously. If you want, if you missed the lecture, you can go back and, and watch that too. So today uh, we'll hear about. We heard about quantum computing, quantum networking, and today we'll hear about quantum sensing. And our speaker today is Dr. Tian Li, who uh, joined uh, UTC in August last year. He came to us from Texas A&M University, where he was at the Institute for Quantum Science and Engineering. Uh, he has a PhD in physics from another world center in quantum science, from the University of Maryland, and NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, which they, both organizations uh, uh, run a joint quantum institute at the NIST site. He has a master's in physics from the University of Nevada in Reno and a bachelor's in physics from the university in Beijing, China. So my pleasure to welcome Tian Li to this lecture series. And, uh, uh, and I think we can look forward to learning something about quantum sensing today. So uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Li. And thank you for the opportunity to present my work, specifically quantum sensing here uh, in the third uh, lectures in the lecture series of Geek City Goes Quantum. Okay, as the name indicates, as the title of the talk, okay, all right, as the title of the talk indicates, I will talk about sensing and specifically this for the optical sensing. All right, so here is the outline of my talk today. First of all, introduction, and second part is a showcase for quantum sensing experiments. And basically there will be two types of quantum sensing, optical sensing, one is continuous wearable and the other one is discrete wearable. And then the third part is the, the research plan that I, this is the research that I plan to do here at UTC in collaboration with ORNL, EPB and QBNAC, taking advantage of the first world, the world first commercial quantum network here in Chattanooga. And the last part is a summary. All right, let's start. First introduction, okay? Always the first part of any talk, introduction. Okay, what is quantum optical sensing? Okay, so I think it's safe to claim, all right? Quantum physics in general provides the most accurate uh, uh, description of the world around us, okay? So classical physics part of it, <laughs> all right? So, um, and I hope we have been convinced by the first two lectures that quantum technology are transforming communication, computing, information processing, and I hope after this talk, you will believe me that quantum technology will also transform, is transforming quant uh, sensing, okay? So, what is optical uh, quantum sensing? What is quantum optical sensing specifically? So you could use a uh, quantum, quantum system to do Sensing is basically measurement, right? So you could, do, you could use uh, different quantum systems to do the measurement. You could use atoms, you could use ions, and you could use superconducting circuits. And you could u even use the center, the NV center in diamonds to do the sensing, okay? And here we're gonna use the particle called photons to do the sensing, all right? So that's why it's called quantum optical sensing. So, Quantum optical sensing is a field of study that uses quantum states of light, quantum states of photons, okay? 
uh, to develop high sensitive de uh, detectors, okay? For measuring physical quantities such as absorption, temperature, magnetic fields, chemical composition, etc. Okay, it's very versatile. It can measure anything. Well, I should not claim because it's broadcasted. Uh, not not anything. Okay, so we have shown that they could measure a lot of quantities. Okay, so using photons as information carriers, like I said, you could use different particles as information carriers. Now we're going to use photons as information carriers. Optical methods offer the most convenient tools for measuring small physical quantities, where our current understanding is limited by the sensitivity, single noise ratio, spatial and temporal resolution of available methods. Okay, so why is that? Why we use photons will be limited by this kind of sensitivity and the single noise ratio of a liberal, uh, resolution of a liberal, uh, available methods. For example, if we use photons, all right, suppose I am a, a biological sample here, okay, and I have absorption, right, so I will absorb photons. And you want to detect my absorption, like how much I can absorb photons, what you could do? You could throw me 10 photons, right? You could throw me 10 photons and absorb one, and after me, there will be nine. So with and without me, you measure 10 photons. And with, without me, you measure 10 photons, all right, on the photon detector. With me, you measure nine, and you say, okay, this guy has 10% of absorption, all right? That's by default that you could measure this 10 photons with infinite accuracy, right, in the first place. But actually, it's not the case. You're not able to measure 10 photons with infinite accuracy. All right? Because of the generation of photons, it's purely random, like the laser. You generate the photons, it's out of the random process. Okay, so laser in principle is a quantum mechanical process. Due to the randomness, you're not able to measure 10 photons without any uncertainty. That's not allowed by nature. For example, if you're standing on a bridge, all right, and you count within one minute, within one minute, how many cars will pass through the bridge and you time one minute, okay? And what do you get? You could expect the first minute in the night clock that you do the experiment. You're standing on the bridge for the whole day. Well, night clock, or well, half a day, night clock to night clock in the night, night clock in the morning, night clock in the night. Those many minutes. And you time the cars. Five cars, first minute, two cars, second minute, three cars, and five, uh, 10 cars, all right? Why is that? Why the cars are different? Because they're random, right? Each driver will know the other driver. They do not know each other. They're completely strangers to each other. So that's a random process, agreed? Unless there's a fleet of cars, maybe for wedding, for, for some other special occasions. Other than that, the process is random. So all you can do is measure a average value. Like during this many minutes, from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock in the night, at the night, I have on average 10, uh, uh, 10 cars pass through the bridge in one minute time. But with the fluctuation of plus minus three cars, right? So you would expect most of your data measurement to fall into this range from nine cars, I'm sorry, from seven cars to 13 cars. The average is at 10, but the fluctuate with plus minus three. All right, that's the best you can do because the generation of those cars are completely random. Everybody has their own free, free will. They will decide fast, accelerate, slow down by their own wi uh, free will. So photons are generated in this, in the same uh, way, like that. Okay, so that's why at the first place, it's not correct to claim that I have 10 photons. Wrong. You have on average 10 photons, but with the uncertainty of that much. And that, the, the statistic called Poissonic di distribution, that's a Poisson distribution, meaning, meaning the uncertainty of this process goes as the square root of the average. So if you have average 100 cars, you expect the uncertainty is 10, square root of 100 is 10. That's the best you can do. That's the laser you can do. That's the state of the art classical sensing can do. 
all right? Because you are limited by the generation of the photons, okay? That's random. All right, so that's why there is a limitation there, okay? If you use photons as uh, information carrier, it's a, it's a limitation there. So here comes the quantum sensing. Quantum optical sensing offers a novel metrology uh, 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 paradigm by providing significant improvement to the ways information collecting and uh, analyzing that even the state of our classical sensing would not be able to offer. Okay, so basically I'm saying quantum optical sensing will reduce the uncertainty of the quantum light so that it will not be square root of the n it will be better than that, s fewer than that. So you will have 100 photons there, and you engineer the, the, the photon source so that you will have a quantum source. On average, you can get 100 photons, and uncertainty is less than square root of 100, less than 10. Could be 5, could be 2, could be 3, right? So now your source is quieter, and you can use the quieter source to do the measurement. Okay, so that's the basis of a quantum optical sensing. Okay, so this talk is based on that, all right? So I will let pictures, graphs, talk, speak, okay? And I will just show one equation if I, do, if I have time. And the very late of the, <laughs> at, at least on the last page of this talk, one equation, all right? So just to make the talk less, or more interesting. Well, I should not say more interesting, I should say less boring, all right? <laughs> Because you've, you've, if you ask a quantum physicist, like especially exper quantum experimentalist, what is your happiest day in the lab? The person will refuse to answer because it's really hard to relate happiness to the lab. <laughs> but if you ask, ask another way, what is at least a miserable day in the life? <laughs> and he is really more willing to answer, okay? <laughs> so the talk will be by default boring. I agree with that but we'll, I will try to make it less boring, all right? <laughs> by, not showing, by not showing equations, just pictures and graphs, okay? All right, like I said, two types of quantum optical sensing here, all right? We have discrete variable and continuous variable. It might sound intimidating. What is a discrete variable, discrete variable, continuous variable? Well, you might have already encountered continuous and discrete variable in your car. All right, I have a Civic I bought in 2015. And the Civic claims that the transmission is continuous variable transmission, meaning that it's no longer just five grids, uh, five stick shifts there, right? Five, what do you call that? Five gears. gears. It has some gears in between, right? So <laughs> you see, it's actually just something that you can have like continuous spectrum, all right? It's not just one to two, and it might be 1.5 there, you know? There, so continuous variable here, for uh, you know, with respect to the uh, photon, it corresponds to the two uh, corresponds to duality of photons. One is for the wave uh, wave nature. So we know that photon th there's wave particle duality for photon, right? Wave particle. So continuous variable corresponds to the wave nature of photon, and discrete variable. It's it naturally corresponds to the particle nature of photon. They're discrete, right? They're just individual. And then you have the continuous spectrum, and then you can use the wave to describe that, okay? So there are two types of quantum optical sensing. You could use continuous variable, the wave nature of, of light to do the sensing, or the particle nature of light to do the sensing. All right, there's two types. All right, although fully equipped, so here is the fun part. These two types sound like very different, just like a duality, they cannot, you cannot separate them. So from the perspective of uh, uh, a theoretical, from the theoretical theory, perspective theory, that they're equivalent. But in practical, this DV and the CV can look very different, yeah, very different. DV paradigms, discrete variable typically require single photon detection, detectors. That's, that's more demanding because you want to take just measure single individual photons. It's very demanding, okay? It's, uh, it's a demanding measure. While continuous variable, require intensity detectors like photodiodes, which is readily available, 60 bucks, 30 bucks, you can buy a photodiode, and a home done detection where via local oscillators. So uh, they're less demanding, they can be incorporated into classical, now we use, in classical world, we use continuous, right? Variable to m do the measurement, right? So it will be uh, compatible with classical techniques. 
So this is actually for that. So the fact that the useful continuous variables, this can exist at relatively high powers because we want to use the wave nature of the photons. And it's be, it, it makes them more practical, okay, uh, than the DV quantum sensors, as they can compete with photon fluxes available to classical techniques, okay. At UTC, even that, you see we're able to conduct quantum sensing with both paradigms, continuous variable and discrete variable, right? My lab can do CV and DV, and a quantum node that's been built on UTC campus, powered by, uh, yeah, you know, connected to the EPP network, and that, work, that lab is designed for the state of art, the top notch DV paradigm, okay? With the SNSPD, with the uh, very good detectors. Okay, that's the introduction, all right, to warm you up. Okay, the second part, the quantum optical uh, uh, sensing case studies. Uh, this part is, I, I like this part a lot because I'm gonna show a lot of pictures. <laughs> all right, there are data, but there are pictures as well, okay? The first one is continuous variable. I have, I have said that it's for the wave nature of the particles, right? It's, you use diodes, okay, to detect its intensities, okay? You don't care individual, uh, you don't care individual photons, just like you do the measurement on, on the bridge. You care about the average, okay? And, and uh, okay, so that's the section, subsection one, continuous variable paradigm. Continuous variable paradigm. Attached to that, there is, oh, I don't, I don't know, what is that? Squeeze light. Squeeze light, okay, that's the terminology that, okay, that's, I, I'm not familiar with that, all right? I mean, you are not familiar with squeeze light, right, when I, when I brought this up, right? <laughs> so let's just do a lot, a short review. Okay, just a short, a very really tiny introduction about the squeeze light, okay? All right, well, squeeze in terms of reducing the noise, okay? So we just make, we just name that. You know, historically, this is named because you just want to squeeze the noise, right? So in terms of a noise of the square root of 10, square root of 100, which is 10, you want to reduce that 10 number to two, to one, okay? To even smaller. So squeeze that noise, all right? So that's called squeeze light. Less noisy, all right? So, okay. So the best classical uh, state for sensing is a coherent state. Oh, another term. What is coherent state? All right. Coherent state is this, the laser. What do you see here? That's a coherent state. Gen the atoms, are, uh, photons are generated out of randomness. Okay, we'll call that as the best classical because it obeys the bosonic distribution. You can easily make a light source like LED, like this room light source, like the LED light. Uh, you know, you can use Zeus li light source to do the measurement, right? You shine the light through the sample, you can see the photons scattered out of the sample. But the noise, uh, the uncertainty associated with that kind of sources are actually much noisier than a laser, laser light. It's, the uncertainty will not skew as square root of, uh, will not skew as the square root of the average, it will be much greater than that. So like a 100 photons on average, you might measure, you might measure on something like 20 instead of 10, which is a laser light. So this is the best, okay? That's a coherent light. Yes, now let's, okay, so pretend we're in a uh, physics, a general physics uh, course, okay, and for electron magnetism, okay, for for young uh, undergrad students, all right. So if I give you this uh, coordinate x and y, and I want to plot you, I want you to plot this this electromagnetic field, okay. This electromagnetic field has the amplitude of alpha and the phase of phi. How are you gonna do that? You plot that, you plot a vector with, uh, with the, uh, the length of the vector alpha, right? Angle of phi, that's how you do that, right? So this is the classical state. I'm sorry, this is the electromagnetic field classically defined. So they will have the well-defined magnitude, right? And a well-defined phase, okay. Heisenberg didn't like it, all right? Because you can, didn't like, be, because you can write this as that. Alpha cosine phi and I sine phi. You have these two quadratures. We call that quadratures. It's actually just the real part and the imaginary part of the electric field. Because these two parts are not commute. They cannot commute, meaning they cannot be measured at the same time, okay? With, with, with infinite good um, 
with extremely good uh, 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 precision. So Heisenberg said, okay, you cannot do that. These two, two quantities cannot be measured like in that way, right? Like the, in the classical way with, with good uh, precision, right? You have to associate noise to, uh, to them, okay? So the noise, uh, that's the x, the real part, and the, uh, the, the imaginary part, okay? On the x-axis and the y-axis. Real axis, the imaginary axis. So Heisenberg will give this, that's the classical amplitude, and that's the classical phase, all right? And now, Heisenberg uncertainty comes in, all right? So it's not, you know, you cannot measure that oh, with the well-defined amplitude and well-defined phase. You have to give uh, uncertainty that. So let's represent uncertainty with a ball. Okay, just, you know, we have the, 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 the uncertainty is there this much, right, on the axis, and this much on the y-axis, right? Okay, so now you measure, you do the measurement. As, okay, so I have the fluctuation there, right? On average, I will have the alpha, but I have to give the uncertainty, right? You report, you report your data with alpha plus minus delta alpha. That's how you do it, right? Because that's the noise, uncertainty. So that's you measure the, the amplitude of the field. That's how you measure the phase of the field. Okay, you have the phase, average is five, and also the delta phi. Okay, right? So this is just a representation, phase, phase space representation of the coherency, the best light we can generate, it. we can use to do the measurement, to do the metrology. Now, quantum comes in. Let's squeeze the ball. Let's squeeze the, the noise ball from a soccer ball to a football, like that. Squeeze it. So in all, it, it's no longer the, the uncertainty now on the act on the amplitude is no longer this wide. It's no longer just the, the diameter of the ball. Now it's the minor axis of that ellipse. So it's less noisy, agreed? And we could do the another way, okay, in the same fashion. That's called amplitude squeeze and called phase squeeze, right? So now you could squeeze the ball in this way. Now you have this phase fluctuation smaller than the diameter of the ball. But you have to pay the price. You didn't take it for free. Look at it. Look at the phase quadrature. It's wider. It's wider than the diameter of the ball, right? Now you me measure the phase quadrature, you have to pay the price that you're gonna have like more noise. Much more uncertainty there. So this is called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, one of the pillars of the quantum mechanics. We're gonna use this, all right? We don't care about that. We're gonna use the amplitude because this electric field strength is proportional to the number of photons in my light, in my light. So I care about number of photons, okay? So I'm gonna use this. So this is called phase squeeze light and I'm gonna use the amplitude squeeze light, okay? First thing, how we generate that? How we gonna generate this squeeze light? Okay, so the mechanism generation of the squeeze light called Fourier mixing. Fourier mixing is a process that releases coupling of four fields so that is satisfying energy and, uh, and momentum conservation. All right, hopefully it, well, it, w <laughs> it won't deter you from my rest of the talk. Okay, it's <laughs> like, oh, let's the nonlinear optical process. Oh, you don't need to understand energy and the momentum conservation, which is also in the first part of the quantum well, it's even smaller, it's even easier than the, the ENM. It's the mechanical part of the general physics, okay? So, energy conservation. You have, electric, you have energy E1, lower energy, higher energy E2, all right? Now you have three photons, one, two, three. What's the fourth one? If you want to, if you want to fulfill this energy conservation. That's the only one, right? So you start from E1, you end from E1, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed, okay? It can only be converted from one form to another, okay? So you, you have the three, you have that four. Energy conservation. You see, one field, two field, three field, four field. Four field mixing, okay? And according, uh, with, uh, on top of that energy conservation, and you have momentum conservation, and you have one field, two field, three field. Momentum conservation constrains constricts the fourth one there. Add the four vectors together, you have the fourth one. 
Okay, so there's four fields there, and the full field energy conservation, momentum conservation, and then we're gonna use that to generate entanglement, or you generate the, the squeeze light, okay? So, my lab is generation of squeeze light, okay. Oh, it's getting deeper and deeper, right? It's getting more specific. Okay, so we're gonna use the four mixing in atomic rubidium 85 cell. Same idea. Now the medium, momentum conservation, still gonna use momentum conservation, right? So I have my cell there. I have a strong pump field. Okay. All right, just one, this is one field. Okay. And I have a weak probe. Okay. Now, boom, the pump photons, you know, split into two, okay? And one add into the probe field. And the momentum conservation will give me the second one there. Just like you threw a bomb in the air and you just the, the, the bomb explodes into two parts, okay? And you fix one direction there, like boom, this one there. And the other one has to be there, right? Because your bomb is flying through this way. Your key vector here, initial, before the collision, after collision, <laughs> right? That's the after collision. This is before the collision. This is after the collision. One is there, one is there. Okay, so now you have the two photons. And energy conservation, well, quantum mechanically doesn't, doesn't like this. Is quantum mechanics doesn't like you leave this port open. You have to give it a name. You have to assign a state there. It's called vacuum fit, okay? So that you can do the calculation. All right, so I, I name it there just to make it more professional. Okay, energy conservation. Ground state, there, I don't like 5s one half. Okay, just leave it alone. That's one energy state, f equals to two, okay? Excited state, 5p one half. This is rubidium D1 line. You drive pump photons for this, uh, this state, all right? The photon, this is pump photon, decay back to that state, okay? And do the energy conserve here? Uh, either energy, uh, is the energy conserved here? Of course not. You start from that field and that field, and there's a separation between these two fields, right? So you're not, this is higher. So there's one photon down, it's not end of it, okay? It's not end of it. So there will be another pump photon up, okay? To the next excess state, and now, and you have the fourth one to drive it back to the ground state. Now you fulfill the energy conservation. You basically steal one photon there, one photon from the pump field, two photons, one there, two there. You bottle them together and you split them, okay, one to the probe and one to the conjugate. Now you see they're generating pairs, they are correlated, okay? This is how you generate entanglement, okay? Okay, so if you do, if you combine these two parties, you generate this pump, it generates probe, it kind of conjugate, you combine them, you put two diodes, you subtract them, okay? And what you got is here. So on the y-axis, that's the uncertainty level, and the blue light is the classical uncertainty, the classical light uncertainty, all right? And the red light is the quantum light uncertainty. It's lower. Right? It's lower than the classical level. So uncertainty is reduced by this much, 80%. Okay? So this is how you measure the uncertainty. You, you want to make sure that I generate a good squeeze light. So this is how you measure uncertainty. dB is engineer term, and I convert that into linear scale, which is 80%. Uncertainty reduced, meaning if you have an average of 10 photons in the classical light, which is this kind of light, okay, you engineer the light, you squeeze the ball, you squeeze the uncertainty of this light, now your uncertainty is 80% reduced. How much photons I have? How much uncertainty do I have there? Two, okay? So the light here, light the squeeze light, out of the generation of the squeeze light, I will have on average 100 photons, but the uncertainty will be just plus minus two, okay? And I will take advantage of this light to do the measurement, okay? So, if I give you this graph, and I want to find out where is the signal. Oh, it's so obvious, your signal. The signal is that right there, right? It's just a peak at 700 kilohertz. Agreed? That's my signal. 
So that's my, this is the classical signal. Because I can reduce the, this, this is the signal, right? That's top, the peak is the signal. And these two wings are the noise. That's why you can ca characterize this signal to noise ratio, right? That's the signal, peak value, and the background value is your noise. That you, that's how you characterize signal to noise ratio, right? That's the classical signal. Now the quantum light is this one, is the blue one. You still have this much signal, but your, your noise background reduced so much. Just like classically, I have 100 photons on average. That's my signal. And the classical uh, uncertainty is 10. That's my noise. 10 plus minus 10. 100 plus minus 10. Now quantum, noise, quantum uh, signal is still 100, right? But noise is 2. Okay, so I have better signal noise ratio, right? Just like that. And this is what's taking the power is 36 milliwatt. Okay. Naturally, you might ask, why bother? Why bother? I have this much classical signal. Why bother you generate quantum light? You know, you, 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 you made so much effort to generate quantum light to reduce signal noise ratio. Why bother? If you have this much uh, if, uh, 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 power to spare, the question is, why? how about I limit your power? I do not give you that 36 milliwatt power. You're limited by the power. For example, you're limited by 7.5 milliwatt. Where is my classical signal? Where is that? It's right there. Buried by the noise. Agreed? I cannot see my classical signal. How about my quantum? Whoa, still there. Single noise ratio can that much, can, can still be that much. Right? You see the advantage right there? This is called quantum advantage, okay? When you are limited by the noise power, uh, limited by the power, uh, point power, actually LIGO, the 2017 Nobel laureate used this idea. You cannot shine the, in, the intense laser in the interferometer by increasing the power indefinitely. No. Okay? You cannot do that because you are limited by some other. If you shine too much power, too much photons into the mirror, although the mirror is suspended, it's not attached to the ground, it's suspended, photons has momentum, and you will have another noise associated with it. You, do, you are limited by the power. Also, for example, if you want to do the measurement for biological samples, you do not want to shine too much power to a biological sample, right? You're going to burn it, right? You want to probe the biological samples, prove their biological functions with minimal disturbance. You don't want to perturb the functionality by your photons, right? You don't want to induce any other you know, burning effect, right? Toxicity effect from the photons. You want to just shine tiny, you want to go gentle. Shine small amount of photons to the, to the biological samples so that those biological functions will occur naturally without this probing or investigation or interrogation, okay? So that's why we have to, we're gonna use the quantum this feature, okay? And apply to a proof for principle imaging uh, application. So a piece of glass in water, okay? So if you see I put a piece of glass in water and I, I, I took shot of that piece of glass, and that's my image. Okay, uh, contrast is pretty low. It's it's not. Uh, I, we basically cannot differentiate from the surroundings, right? It's it's there or not there. I don't know. Now you sh you shine the, the quantum light. You can clearly see there's a piece of glass right there. So the white the white little bar is uh, is uh, one millimeter. So you see this is five millimeter. So it's a tiny piece of. Uh, a piece of glass there, okay? So this is a proof of principle and published in Optica last year, okay, to, to, to demonstrate the quantum advantage, okay? And we have this set, we have this uh, scheme at hand, and we can now apply that. As this proof of principle succeed, and we apply that to biological sample as well, okay? So there are some data after this proof of principle experiment. So the data is non-viable 41 breast cancer cells suspended in hydrogel. So the sample was prepared by biomedical, uh, biomedical engineering department in Texas A&M University. And this uh, cancer cells, they are dead, but you have to actually uh, keep, it, keep it life for a while. You put them in a deposit like in a spheroid and put it uh, to fix them into the space using hydrogel, okay? One kind of like uh, biomedical material. 
and then suddenly froze them. Okay, suddenly freeze them so that they could just fix things in space, right? They're dead. Okay, so it's a cancel And then we put that under the our quantum light, and classical and quantum light, and to compare the uh, the contrast of them. Okay, so this is the cancer cell uh, under the wide field microscope. All right, this is cancer cells. You see those uh, tentacles there. Those are tentacles. They are actually they desperately need nutrition, so they're actually growing. Okay, so you see the cells are not round. You expect cells are round, it's actually not. They're elongated. And the glucose cancer cells are very ag aggressive, so they will actually just, you, you wa they want to take in the nutrition in the hydrogel, so they actually they grow that much, and then suddenly you freeze them in space. Okay, they're dead, but they're dead in that prime time. Okay, so, and then we focus on this small area, this blue, uh, I don't know if you can see that clearly, this, uh, this uh, 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 green square, so we zoom that out, okay, this is a wide field image, and this white bar indicates 100 microns, okay? So there are just a few cells in that square, uh, uh, green square. So, okay, so we, we, may, we can lock the signal on the hydrogel, so we, we, this is a classical signal, right? So we know that there might be something there, but it's just not that clear to us, okay? Now we turn on the quantum light, whoa, that there. So those, those like islands, those islands are the, uh, the uh, cells, okay? So it clearly shows up. It clearly, you know, uh, you can tell those cells from this background, all right? So we can also uh, just lock the signal at the cells, all right? So, and then classical, even worse, light. We cannot tell if there are cells or uh, just some de uh, debris or some, some other stuff. And then, you see, clearly we have those cells shows up, okay? Those cells show up on the quantum light. Right, so this could significantly, it was clearly tell, a very storytelling example that quantum light can be, uh, can be very advantageous. Agreed? Okay, so we, do th we did this, and we also applied uh, this uh, quantum light scheme uh, to image uh, this. Uh, this is also, this is in collaboration with, te uh, with Texas a and physics, IQSE, where I, I came from, and BIM, uh, biological agriculture engineering, and biomedical engineering. The sample I prepared was prepared by my biomedical engineering department. So, and we also imaged the non-variable smooshed uh, uh, Drosophila brain. So that's the wide image, the wide field image of that brain, that brain, okay? And we lock our signal at lipid uh, resonance. So you see those, those, uh, those squares, where the hydrogel cell and liquid, they're just techniques, right? We just want, they, we, I want, we want to prove that our scheme is very versatile. It's just not only for one substance. It can be locked at the water and, and, and different uh, substance contains in that sample, okay? So it's locked at the lipid. You, you assume that most of the brain actually contains, is comp uh, the brain is composed, you know, most part of the brain is lipid. Okay, so we lock that there, and that's a classical image. Again, nothing there, well, there. So we can just differentiate that this, those are lipids, where lipids are concentrated there in the brain. Okay? All right, okay, so now those are dead cells, and now we also put the live cells under our, you know, under our quantum light. So this is a result. We prove continuous shine our uh, light through the cells. We wanted just to see if there's degradation there and how much degradation will be induced by those photons, okay? And we shine through three hours there, that's three hours, and this is a classical light. And that's the y-axis cell degradation in terms of percent. So after three hours of shining, of classical light, only 10% of the lab cells survived. And then we turn on our quantum light we have 40% survive. You see? So it's just, you know, we just present that, and we can see, like, do you want to buy my device? Yeah? And after three hours of uh, interrogation, and you still have 40% of uh, livelihood of the cells, and you can extend the ex interrogation time to six hours. How about that? Right? Yeah, so it's very promising, right? It's one of the, um, um, you know, the advantage, well, the, the quantum light, why, one, why quantum sensing nowadays are very, uh, you know, uh, attract much attention, okay? Because it has direct application to uh, biomedical imaging, uh, biomedical imaging community, okay? 
All right. We also did some other bio-related uh, quantum sensing, like the absorption I just mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, of the lecture. And we have this much quantum advantage. You see that when the absorption is like less than 10%, okay? 0.1 is 10%. When the absorption is less than 10%, you have this much advantage there. This is quantum, and that's the classical. You have this much advantage. Just to prove that, we, have, we can measure, those are data points. Okay, so we could even measure like 1%, 1% of absorption with this little uncertainty there. Okay, with little uncertainty there. All right, that's one. Okay, so, all right, so I have five minutes, right? Yeah. 10 minutes. Okay. Another one is fluorescein. And fluorescein is safe, it's a biomarker. Okay, it pr it's widely used for, uh, for, uh, for biological studies, okay? So we shine the quantum light to the fluorescein. Not only that we could reduce the, the noise. In this experiment, which is to show that, can we increase the signal as well? Okay, now reduce the noise background. Can we increase the signal size? And we did, and we succeed. And that's the, you see, when the power is at 8 milliwatt for classical, you just shine the quantum light through the fluorescein sample, okay? And the classical light will give you this much signal right there, this much signal. And the quantum will give you this much signal. You see, you could drastically increase the signal size due to the uncertainty, uh, due to the entanglement, due to the quantumness of the light, okay? So this is signal to noise ratio. You could reduce the noise background or increase the signal size. You can also increase the signal size ratio, right? So this is experiment to prove that it can be done in that way. Use the quantum light, okay? That's the classical point, that's the quantum point. I think that's, uh, okay, that's all the, the continuous variable. Discrete variable, I don't want to spend too much time, just one slide. Discrete variable, we can probe ultra fast dynamics. Okay, so this was done. And we can have these, uh, you know, when the laws, for, for example, you put a biological sample under your classical light, you lose 80% of your classical light. You lose 80% of it. Were you still able to probe some ultra fast dynamics, like in the picosecond range? I don't think so. Maybe you can. So, but quantum mechanically, we can, okay? So like when the loss is 80%, for example, biological sample, you can scatter photons every, you know, they're much scatter, you know, the biological samples are very prone to photon scattering, okay? You're gonna lose a lot of photons there, but we're still able to prove the, uh, the, the, the dynamics in the, you know, in that range, in that uh, a tens of uh, femtosecond range, okay? It's 10 to the minus 15 seconds using this discrete variable that the entangled photon pairs generated, okay? Okay, so our, my plan, quantum network sensing with EPB and qubit hack, okay? So all the, the, the showcases that you just heard, you just saw, those are for single parameter measurement at a single location, agreed? Absorption, just single parameter, right? Uh, you know, fluorescence, contrast of the image, one single parameter, at one location in the lab, okay, just where the lab is. How about we want to measure multiple parameters at multiple locations? And naturally, this quantum network comes in. What we're gonna do, we're gonna distribute our in entanglement, okay? Not just two, we split them so that you could have multiple, in, you know, multiple branches of the entanglement you can use, okay? So this is the idea. So this is in collaboration among UTC Physics and Electrical Engineering and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, EPB and uh, Qubitech. Still, we have the probe and conjugate. If you, if I just like, if, I hope you still remember the term, <laughs> like the probe and conjugate. They're just entangled parties, okay? Probe, this one, conjugate, there, there one. So just, just split them. Simply just split them, okay? Split them from one to two, and uh, this one to two, 
and split them from one to two, one to two, one to two. Okay. Now you have instead of two, how many? How many are there? One, two, three, four. Yeah, you have four. You split them, but you don't. You don't. You know. You're expecting. You, if you, once you split them. <laughs> You will introduce noise, right? Once you do something to the quantum, quantum is actually very fragile. Okay, entanglement is even fragile. Entanglement is very fragile. Okay, you split them, you add noise to them. Okay, you you manipulate the, the quantum states. Actually, you will introduce uncertainty more. It's no longer the the uns the, the you know the the quantum the entanglement there in, in at the beginning you generated. You're gonna have the degraded entanglement there. Okay. So that's why we're gonna collaborate with uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Ronald Rising at the Electro Engineer. Uh, his expertise of uh, machine learning. So hopefully, uh, by you know, surprise the noise, you know, here, right here, in 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 what you know, in the in the process of splitting those uh, entanglement, and in, in inevitably you introduce the noise. Hopefully, we can surprise that effect of the noise so that we can still have entanglement at the detection stage. Okay. So first step we want to try is the phase measurement. Okay, so it's always the first measure parameter that quantum uh, sensing community do because it's, uh, um, it's easier. Okay, so, and we always pe pick that as the uh, proof of principle experiment, okay? So it will be, we use machine learning and the idea is based on one of my papers. Uh, that, that's my, okay, so one of my papers that, you know, the signal, the quantum signal, okay? So you generate an entanglement, okay? So you will have the classical part and quantum part. This is, I promise you, this is the only equation, okay? <laughs> this is the only equation. Remember, I haven't seen any equation, right? This is the only one. Okay, so this is the classical part of that signal, of the signal that you measure, okay? And that's the quantum part. And you, you, if you look at this closely, you see that if P is greater than one, if P is greater than one, classical dominates, agreed? Square dominates, then the linear. If P is less than one, quantum dominates, right? So that's why we cannot, we want to reduce the thing like photon numbers, right? We want to reduce photon numbers, just like a CV, continuous variable quantum key distribution. Uh, continuous, yeah, CVQ key D. They, they have to, sh uh, uh, you know, the, the pilot tone, the, the technique is the pilot tone and this, uh, the quantum signal, the, the pilot tone, the, you, don't, you cannot shine too many photons. You cannot send, you are, you are not allowed to, to, you know, to input too much, too many photons there. You, uh, you, you can uh, contaminate your quantum signal. Same idea here. You cannot put too many photons there because you might have like classical dominates there. So you have like small uh, number of photons so that your quantum signal dominates. But the idea here is your laws actually will not annihilate your quantum signal at all. As you indefinitely increase the loss, you see, the loss comes in the exponent, ex exponential. It will not annihilate the term, right? The term will always be there, agreed? It's just asymptotically smaller, smaller, and smaller. But it's always there, okay, as you increase the loss. Okay, so hopefully we could use machine learning technique to sort this part out from this classical background, okay? Like this experiment showing that this is quantum signal and a classical signal, as, as you increase the loss, quantum is always advantageous than classical, okay? You cannot just, these two lines will never converge. Um, yeah, it will not overlap with each other. This line, the, the blue line, will always higher than the right line, okay? That's it, summary. Two more minutes. Quantum optical sensing have attracted much attention most recently, not only in the field of quantum information science, but also in chemistry and biology. Hopefully I convinced you on that. My quantum optical sensing lab capable of uh, implementing both CV and DV paradigms is currently being built in Grotti on the second floor. And the project to be functioning before 4, 2023. Depends on uh, when can I get my laser due to the, uh, the, uh, the supply chain backlog. And my latest order from Europe, so from Germany, so um, that takes time. 
The UTC quantum node connected to EPB quantum network is scheduled to be launched in July 2023 for DV paradigm quantum optical sensing. So we see we have both capabilities, so CV and DV, okay? And there's plenty of room for exciting quantum optical sensing experiments that can be produced on the UTC campus. And thank you for your attention and go marks. <laughs>I have questions. All right, I've got one. Is there an advantage for DV versus CV sensing for different applications or in general? Uh, yes, it's, that's a good question. The, the CV is always advantageous. Um, it's case by case. Yes. So for um, it depends how much it basically depends how much power you can spare. If the biological sample is really robust, you can use CV because it's more compatible with te classical techniques. You just set up a diode and collect the photons there. If the biological sample is not robust, you, ju you use DV and you set single photon detectors there. Because the it CV will actually degrade the sample. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You can, you know, it will, the biological sample is after some time of uh, interrogation there, it will kill the sample. Too much photon, too many photons is always for biological samples is always a not good thing. But you know, in terms of money, DV is more expensive than CV. Continuous variable is much uh, is uh, economical than it's more econ economical than the DV because DV requires the single photon detector, um, and CV just photodiodes. Like I said, photodiodes is few, uh, you know, it's just fifty bucks. And a, a single photon counting modules with the time correlator, well, it's easily you have to pay like 10K. Or well, 5,000 for, for just one detector. But you want to have the, in the entanglement measurement, right? You have the two parties, so you, have, you need at least two detectors. So that will give you like a 10K. And the counting module, on top of that, you have to buy a counting module. So that's more expensive. What kind of opportunities do you foresee for undergraduate students oh. at UTC to work with you? Yes, so this, uh, in my lab, yes. So you see the, the squeeze light generation. It's actually a great question. Um, uh, it, it, too much light. So the squeeze light generation, <laughs> the squeeze light generation there, those setup can be maintained by one or two trained lab workers. It's, uh, they're su it's sufficient, you know. So um, we all need just a laser and a cell and some uh, splitting, some, uh, you know, so, so just uh, set, uh, generate the light, um, you know, split the light. Um, you know, we have the pump. Remember, we have the pump and probe, and we have to split the probe from the pump using some, uh, uh, you know, um, some so-called acoustic optical modulator. So there are not, uh, my point is, there are not so many optical instruments involved there. So undergrad, after proper training, they can take responsibility for the setup, for the source, okay? And there are many side projects, and it can be done by the undergrad students, okay? Like, you set up the cell, you want to maintain the temperature of the cell, you have to build a housing of the cell, so that can be done by, uh, by undergrads. It doesn't involve any quantum mechanical training. They don't need to take the lecture. They don't need to take the course. They all need to do like, how are we gonna maintain a temperature of a cell? <laughs> how are we gonna, you know, they all need to know Ohm's law, right? You sign the current, you, sign, you have the resistance, and then it can generate power out of it, and the power converts it to heat. And they want to maintain the heat as const heat transport as constant, so that the cell temperature is constant. And that kind of thing, and, um, yeah, so there are many side projects in my lab, you know, they can be, uh, I can assign that to undergrads, like soldering, cert design circuits, uh, for controlling this temperature, you know, there's electronics control this optics, they can be done by undergrads, and also the quantum node, and uh, we have the plan, of, I remember the, the, the certificate program, 
uh, you know, to develop a scientific program here, and uh, the quantum node will play an important role there. Um, yes, undergrad can also work in the, uh, you know, the, the can also work in the quantum node lab. So uh, there are many, uh, you know, we, we have many opportunities for undergrads on UTC uh, campus. Once both my lab and the, the, the quantum node, they're fully functioning. Well, yeah, we, we'll, we'll find a way of uh, sending undergrads into the labs, okay? <laughs> it's, it <laughs> yeah, we'll find a way. Question, uh, have commercial biomedical imaging companies started to adopt uh, the uh, squeeze light technology yeah. and, and implement it in instrumentation? Yes, uh, we talk, we, we, we um, this experiment that was done, okay, so this experiment, especially this one. So this experiment, actually the data was taken when I was still with Texas A&M last year at this, around this time, like four or May. Um, and now, after, after I was hired by UTC and this, this part, uh, we're, we're still working on that. We're still working on that, okay? And you see, uh, the, the problem is, the, the, the problem is right here, you see the bar right there is 100 microns, right? So, and you see the microns there, and you are not able to tell the cell with current resolution. You're not able to tell cell, how many cells are there? I don't know. So this is actually useless to biomedical, I am not say useless, <laughs> not that useful to biomedical community. They want to clearly tell the cell and tell the guts in the cell, like a mitochondria. Mitochondria is one microns wide, a few microns, uh, one microns in, you know, this, this ellipso, el elliptical, um, you know, it's, it has an elliptical size with a major axis of like a 10 microns, the minor axis is one micron. So one micron is actually it's the width of the mitochondria. If you want to see the mitochondria, the resolution has to be one micron. And here the resolution is not that great. It is, this resolution is limited by the laser beam size of five microns. So we're kind of, we work desperately to improve the, we're working to improve the resolution so that it could be sub microns. But that requires optical remodification and you know, you want to align these two lasers within one microns. It's, you know, it's not trivial. So, once that is, you know, when I have, we have increased resolution, and I, the, uh, I definitely, they will, uh, I mean, hopefully they will <laughs> be more interested in this, uh, this type of work. And that's part of your current research, is how to part get of, that yeah. level of refinement. Right, this is part of my current research. Uh, I work remotely now, <laughs> like you know, with I collaborate with them. I, we have the Zoom talk every every week, so hopefully we can submit this out somewhere, you know, with more impressive bio images. Any other questions, well, Dr. Lee? Thank you so much. This has been really amazing. <laughs>